as we connect together over the next two days, both in person and online. The eCampus Ontario offices and the Toronto Reference Library, where we're gathered here today, are located on the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples from across Turtle Island. We also acknowledge that these lands are covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and that this land is part of the Dish with One Spoon territory, a treaty between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Anishinaabek, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for this land, its waters, and all of the beautiful biodiversity in the Great Lakes region. All who come to live and work here are responsible for honoring treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And I encourage all of those joining us online to please explore and learn more about the traditional lands and territories from where you are located. And I would also like to acknowledge and honor Justice Murray Sinclair, who passed away yesterday, a renowned leader and champion of human rights, justice, and truth. And if we could please take a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now joining, joining us this morning, morning we, we have, have some very special guests. guests. And um, at this time, it's my pleasure, pleasure to introduce the, the Honorable, Honorable Nolan Quinn, Minister of Colleges and Universities, to kick off today's proceedings. Nolan Quinn was born and raised in Cornwall, Ontario, where he has been deeply involved in community service, which led him to run as MPP for Stormont Dundas South Glengarry in 2022. Minister Quinn recognizes the important role that the post-secondary education sector plays in educating and training the next generation workforce that will contribute to Ontario's economic prosperity. Minister Quinn is a graduate of St. Lawrence College, receiving a diploma in business management and human resources. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to the Honorable Nolan Quinn, Minister of Colleges and Universities. Good morning. I'm still not used to that introduction. It's too kind, so thanks. thanks. I appreciate that. It's fantastic to be here today at the start of what is sure to be an engaging couple days. I want to start by thanking eCampus Ontario for bringing us all together. What a great opportunity for us to connect with each other in person. As leaders in the digital learning space, I'm sure you can all appreciate the chance to be in the same room together a chance to build connections and gain insight into how we can best support students through digital learning. This is a special year for eCampus Ontario as they celebrate their 10th anniversary. Congratulations on this tremendous milestone. That's a decade of driving innovation, collaboration, and transformation across post-secondary education sector in Ontario. And 10 years of bringing together the post-secondary education community around the common goal of empowering all learners no matter where they live in Ontario or their life stage or their circumstances, to not only participate, but to succeed in their post-secondary education journeys and in the workforce. Let's all give eCampus Ontario a round of applause. As the new minister, although it's almost three months now, so I think this line is getting a bit old, uh, I was really looking forward to attending the first test event because I want to let, to let everyone know that the common goal around which you're gathered here today is one that I deeply share. As the dad to three young children and the husband to a teacher, I'm a firm believer that education is one of the greatest enablers of success, both at the individual level and for our province and nation as a whole. It's post-secondary education that drives innovation and economic growth that creates better opportunities for everyone across Ontario. My family and I live in the St. Andrews West, which is about as far east as you can go before hitting the Quebec border. It's where I grew up. It's where I started my family. It's where I started my business as well. It's where I became committed to community service and volunteering, fundraising, and working to make sure I helped in all the ways I could to support the people of my area. 
while we're only an hour from Ottawa or Montreal, we're a very small town community where everyone looks out for each other. I've seen firsthand just how important post-secondary education and training is in rural areas. Investing in people truly builds up the entire local area. And so I'm firmly committed, and I know that our government is equally committed to helping people in every corner of Ontario get the education and training they need to find rewarding careers. Digital technologies are so important in this sense as they deliver education and training that meets users where they are. They are valuable tools that can be used to provide more equitable access to learning and training opportunities, to give everyone in Ontario the opportunities to succeed and thrive. To support this goal from 2020 to 2024, our government made a historic investment of over $70 million in Ontario's virtual learning strategy. There have been over 450 projects supported to date that are expanding access to high quality digital learning experiences. These projects go beyond technology-based learning and teaching to include supports for students' mental health, professional growth, and well-being. Let me showcase one particular initiative that was supported by our virtual learning strategy. eCampus Ontario's Open Education Library, which now houses close to 4,500 resources. Funding from the virtual learning strategy has supported the creation of more open educational resources, as well as increased adoption of these resources among faculty at post-secondary institutions. These resources have so much potential to make education more affordable, accessible, and effective for students. In fact, the use of open educational resources is estimated to have already saved Ontario learners over $26.5 million since 2017. I encourage, I encourage everyone here today, as well as online, to explore the open library and consider how its resources could be integrated into the learning experiences you offer your students. The work you are doing couldn't be more important. Developing innovative, modern, digital learning across provinces gives students the experience they need to hit the ground running after graduation to become the leaders that build our economy brick by brick, the innovators that create the jobs of tomorrow and for the future, and the hard workers that are the backbone of our province's success. The ideas that take shape here today will go a long way into increasing our flexible and accessible post-secondary education sector for more people in every corner of Ontario. Thank you, and I wish you all a productive conference. Thank you very much, Minister Quinn. Uh, I know you have to go off uh, to Ottawa to uh, fight the good fight for the, uh, the sector, so we really appreciate you coming by. Uh, um, it's our pleasure to welcome you to your, your first test and also to introduce you to the leaders of education here in the province. I'm just gonna take a moment to run myself a selfie. Thank you for that. Uh, just want to acknowledge a few folks who are in the room. Uh, some of our board members are here. I saw Andre Cote. Um, uh, Marquita Evans is here uh, as well. Nice to see you, Marquita. You'll be hearing from her a little bit later on our uh, panel. Uh, Marcia Josephs is here, the head of the Indigenous Institutes Consortium. Uh, Lori Harrison, nice to see you. Uh, Aidan D'Souza also is here. I'm really uh, pleased to have some of our board members join us today. And if I've forgotten anybody, it's because I haven't seen you yet and I look forward to seeing you at some point in time today. I also want to uh, acknowledge that our assistant deputy minister is in the room. Zoe Croker is here. Zoe, where are you there? First time we've met in person. Uh, great to hear uh, the minister talk about the virtual learning strategy and open educational resources. We have uh, some uh, really good uh, information coming up about that with Rajiv Janjani and his colleagues from Brock University and University of Ottawa. So bojo, kwayen, bienvenue, and welcome to the 2024 Technology and Education Seminar and Showcase, or TESS 2024. Uh, this year, as you heard, eCampus Ontario is marking our 10-year anniversary. And for 10 years, we've worked to grow best-in-class digital by design learning 
And over the past year, we've made some significant changes to our governance. And I wanted to take a few moments to share this with you as we celebrate our anniversary, and more importantly, this year's theme, Transforming Together. So we were established in 2014. For those of you who would know that uh, 10 minus 24 is 14. Uh, and our goal was to be the only organization that convenes the entirety of the post-secondary education sector for the 21st century. Uh, at the time, we were represented by colleges and universities, and Ontario's Indigenous Institutes, in operation for over 30 years, uh, were officially granted standing with the passing in 2017 of the Indigenous Institutes Act. And that act officially acknowledged Indigenous Institutes as a distinct and recognized pillar within Ontario's post-secondary education system, of course, alongside colleges and universities. So we amended our bylaws in 2020. Actually, it was my second day of work uh, to, to do this uh, back in 2020. Uh, and that year, and I think on my fourth day of work, Kenja Gaywintig became our first Indigenous Institute member. In February of this year, we changed our bylaws again. And this was to include Indigenous Institutes as part of our governance, where previously we had co-chairs represented by the president of a college and a university. We now have a tripartite governance structure uh, with a vice chair, chair, and past chair represented by the president of an Indigenous Institute, a college, and a university. Now, this shared model of governance was a result of planning since 2020. Our board secretary, Jason Northway Frank, is here somewhere. Uh, if you haven't seen him, you will. Jason, are you here? Good wave, thanks, there he is. Um, Jason led uh, most of this work um, and also a year of consultations led by our co-chair and now past chair, Dr. Stephen Murphy on behalf of our nominating committee. Now this consultation was not simply looking to find the easiest way to integrate indigenous institutes in our governance, but to really listen and learn how best to do this while working on decolonization of our governance as part of our commitment to reconciliation. So I'm very grateful for the work that Stephen has done on behalf of the board and certainly with the support of our co-chair, now chair, Dr. Anne-Marie Vaughan, and certainly all of our board members to lead this work on behalf of all of us. Uh, we're now joined today by Rebecca Jameson, the president and CEO of uh, Six Nations Polytechnic and vice chair of the eCampus Ontario board. I'm going to uh, shortly introduce you to Rebecca formally uh, to give some words of welcome as well. Uh, we're also joined on our board by Kim Valsino, Vice President of Ashki Pamashawin, and who joins uh, as part of a Senior Administrative Representative. A couple of months ago, I went to go and meet uh, Rebecca at our campus in Brantford, and it was a great opportunity to get to know each other uh, and to learn a little bit more about the Six Nations uh, history, but also the education that uh, the Polytechnic provides. Indigenous Institutes provide culturally relevant, career-focused education, supporting Indigenous learners from all ages and stages of life to learn skills and competencies while supporting cultural vitality. And this is a model for us all. Rebecca showed me a striking mural at the entrance to the campus and on four panels, the mural depicts the history of education for the Six Nations people. It was the, on one panel, the traditional education that informs their culture and history uh, then the disruption of contact with Europeans when Indigenous people were providing education, the terrible legacy of forced colonial residential schools, and then the cultural resurgence of taking control of their education. Now, this offers a key lesson for us all, not just about the importance of education. And certainly, Marilyn, you uh, talked about the Honorable Mary Sinclair and his commitment to education, and I'm thankful that you uh, honor his memory uh, today with a moment of silence, because of, certainly he was a, a strong advocate for human rights, uh, but also about the, the rights that we all have as, as citizens and the right to accessing education for everybody. It also tells us about the essential need for Indigenous educational sovereignty and the responsibility we all share to support this. So last year I served on the Blue Ribbon panel, which explored the financial sustainability of our sector. Uh, certainly at a time like this, uh, you know, given the financial challenges we are all facing, that work was and is even more important. Uh, we spent a lot of time on the panel talking about access to education and how important that was about uh, access to education for Northern learners, for international learners, for Francophone learners. We didn't really talk much about access to education for Indigenous learners because that was to be the subject of another panel. But in, it is only to Indigenous people that we actually have a legal obligation to provide 
post-secondary education. And what I did learn on the panel is that Indigenous institutes do not have guaranteed or adequate funding to support their operations. Now, of course, this is a shared federal and provincial responsibility, but it is also now your responsibility as it became mine when I learned this. So our commitment to reconciliation means that we take action based on our understanding today to build a better understanding tomorrow. And I ask that you join me in advocating for more equity in education. For as we chart the next 10 years of education in Ontario, we know that there's a lot of uncertainty, financial, existential, what's going to happen later today, I know we're all wondering. But when we work together, our most creative and innovative solutions come to the fore. When we work together, we can co-design the futures of education and promote our vision, which is that all Ontarians have a better future through digital higher education. So over the next two days, you're going to hear from trailblazers in education policy, technology, inspiring speakers, each offering unique insights into co-creating accessible, adaptable, and future-ready learning experiences. Together, we can empower institutions, educators, and learners to navigate and thrive in our rapidly evolving world. Now, you cannot talk about education without talking about technology. And the next two days gives us all a chance to talk with and learn from our peers, each and every one of you in the room, and those of you who are joining us online, as we work together on transforming together our education sector. Uh, this morning's keynote is by Dr. Jennifer Wemigwans, and you have a copy of her book, A Digital Bundle, uh, on the table there. I've read this uh, book over the past week and learned a lot about the representation of Indigenous knowledge on Indigenous platforms, so thank you for, uh, for your work. Uh, this is going to challenge your thinking about the use of digital platforms and even about the use of open educational resources. And I would say to you that this is a good thing to be challenged as we think about how can we best support Indigenous educational sovereignty, but also access of education for all. So I want to extend a big thank you to our sponsors, the Government of Ontario, the Ministry of Colleges and Universities. They're our platinum partner and key sponsor for all we do. Our gold sponsors are Body Swaps, who are sponsoring breakfast today and tomorrow. Instructure, who is our event venue sponsor. This is my first time in this event venue, by the way. It's quite nice. Uh, Pebble Pad, who is sponsoring today's lunch. Thank you all. And our silver sponsors, Align Designs, CCI Learning, Contact North, Jove, and Oncat. And of course, the Indigenous Institutes Consortium, Marsha, uh, Happy uh, anniversary for selling, celebrating 30 years uh, this year, and congratulations. Uh, IIC is our sponsor for captioning of today's keynote for Dr. Wimigwins. So please visit the vendors in the vendor hall in the back. Uh, all of the vendors who have a table have a sticker that you can put on your name card and use this to enter our draw. There was a box here, it's gone. There's a box somewhere for you to put uh, your name card with stickers on. Uh, and that draw is going to, <clears throat> going to be tomorrow for a, a $100 gift certificate to Indigo Books. And later today, we'll have a, celebrate, a celebration and a reception to celebrate our 10-year anniversary. There's going to be cake and a time machine, so don't miss it. I hope you can join us then and celebrate this milestone together. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Rebecca Jameson, the president and CEO of Six Nations Polytechnic and vice chair of the eCampus Ontario board. Welcome, Rebecca. Hey. Well, it's certainly nice to be here on this beautiful warm day and greetings to all in the room and to those who are online. I hope you're having a, a wonderful day as well, wherever you are. Um, I wanna begin by thanking Robert. Uh, for bringing forward the unique situation of the Indigenous Institutes in Ontario with respect to operational funding. Today, I want to acknowledge, also want to acknowledge eCampus for its proactive approach for Indigenous Institutes participation in Ontario's post-secondary education. eCampus was the first organization to reach out to systemically support our Institute's engagement in virtual learning, and this included the governance level, as you have heard. It's also important to acknowledge 
that Ontario was the first province to pass legislation in 2017, recognizing our institutes as playing a unique role in the post-secondary system. It's especially important to note that the Act specifically states that the Government of Ontario and the institutes have come together in the spirit of reconciliation, mutual respect, and mutual accountability to enhance educational opportunities for Indigenous students and to promote the revitalization of Indigenous languages, cultures, and knowledges. It's important also to acknowledge that the passage of with the Act, the province of Ontario through the Ministry of Colleges and Universities has worked to develop a more predictable funding mechanism for the institutes and this work continues. Most recently in mid-October, the final report of the Indigenous Institute's Financial Sustainability and Growth Circle was submitted to the Minister. The circle was established following the report of the Blue Ribbon Panel that Robert mentioned. The circle's final report summarizes the discussion on the key issues identified by the circle, the potential funding framework, and recommendations endorsed by the Indigenous in Institutes. And I know that our Institutes look forward to Ontario's continued support of our pillar. It is true that our institutes are unique in Ontario's PSE in many ways. Although we function for the most part with project-based annual funding, we reach and graduate students who would otherwise not participate in post-secondary education. We work hand in hand with employers to meet pressing labor market needs. And we are so pleased that our graduates are often contracted for employment before graduation. We address the revitalization of our languages and cultural practices so needed for the well-being of our people, communities, and nations as we recover from the legacy of residential schools and other assimilation practices endured by the past generations. Many IIs partner with colleges and universities to deliver much needed programs and we're very pleased that many of our graduates continue their education with these partners, then often return to our communities and surrounding regions to take on much needed responsibilities, including leadership positions. So is there, there is a great potential if only the Indigenous Institutes in Ontario could be assured of operational funding in place of yearly project and proposal-based funding. In our efforts to address this, we have submitted a detailed business case to the federal government for two consecutive years, yet there has been no change. So our Institutes in Ontario continue to grapple with annual funding proposals with an ever-shrinking economic capacity due to inflation. I'm gonna give you an example. In July of this year, Indigenous Institutes received their allocation from the Federal Post-Secondary Partnership Program. Six Nations Polytechnic, my institute, received 37% less than the 2019 allocation, while our student population and needs increased by 268%. The allocation is one third of the requested amount for the programs needed to run this fall. And when inflation is taken into consideration, the allocation's effect is even less. Clearly receiving an allocation in July, so close to the start of the school year, makes it extremely difficult for program and staff planning, negatively impacts student enrollments, and puts our fiscal condition at very high risk. It seems that the federal program is designed to let Indigenous institutes struggle and fail. Indigenous institutes urgently need long-term sustainable, equitable funding. What will it take to change the current situation? When we consider this question, we're reminded that the first residential school accepted its first students in 1831. That was at the Mohawk Institute located on Six Nations land in what is now Brantford. Sadly, we're reminded that 176 years later, it took over 10 years and multiple court cases to attain the 2007 $2 billion Indian residential school agreement which was the result of the largest class action in Canada. We are reminded that it took the death of a young Cree child, Jordan River Anderson, to propel the House of Commons in 2007 to pass Jordan's principle, which was a commitment that First Nations students would get the products, services, and supports they need when they need them, and to ensure a tragedy like this would never happen again. But then we are reminded that the passage of Jordan's principle was followed by years of glacial federal policy change, spurred by multiple legal actions and ultimately multiple Canada Human Rights Tribunal orders to begin to see the substantive equality and culturally appropriate services envisioned in Jordan's principle. 
So what is substantive equity? This refers to the achievement of true equality in outcomes. It's achieved through equal access, equal opportunity, and most important, the provision of services and benefits in a manner and according to standards that meet any unique needs and circumstances, such as cultural, social, economic, and historical disadvantage. Substantive equality is both a process and an end goal related to the outcomes that seek to acknowledge and overcome the barriers that have led to the inequality in the first place. When substantive equality is in outcomes does not exist, inequality remains. So what's it gonna to take to change the situation? As you heard, we have lost a true champion, Murray Sinclair, who among other things and his services to humanity chaired the Truth and Reconcil Reconciliation Commission that issued 94 calls to action in 2015. And sadly, many of those calls to action are still waiting. But as the late Murray Sinclair stated, education got us into this mess and education's going to get us out. We know that investing in, in our institutes not only serves crucial educational purposes, but also has a significant positive impact on Canada's economy. This includes an incredible return on investment with a three to one ratio over the next two decades. A stable investment could result in over 40,000 new skilled workers that are much needed, and at least a 4.5 billion in addition to the GDP. So beyond the moral imperative, investing in our institutes is smart. A new study of attitudes in Ontario conducted by the Indigenous Institutes Consortium and the nonprofit and Veronics Institute for Survey Research finds broad public support for measures to improve the funding, delivery and outcomes of education and training for Indigenous peoples living in Ontario. From the survey, we found that this is not a controversial issue for the public, that Indigenous learners should have the same opportunities for success as other people in Ontario. So I ask, what does having the same opportunities for success in education mean? It has to mean substantive equity for opportunity and outcomes. And Indigenous Institutes are crucial, critical means for providing this. At SMP, we have serious concerns about data sovereignty and the misuse of AI to spread incorrect information about Indigenous knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, cultural practices, and our languages. We need to have the capacity to address these concerns. So today and tomorrow, as you listen to the inspiring speakers, Please consider the matter of substantive equity of opportunity for Indigenous learners and Indigenous institutes and consider supporting our efforts. We live and work in different places and spaces and face different challenges, yet we are all interdependent and responsible for the legacy that we leave for the future generations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, I think we're going to have a uh, video message from Anne-Marie Vaughan, President and CEO of Humber Polytechnic. Possibly. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this year's eCampus Ontario's Technology Education Seminar Showcase, or better known as TESS 2024. As chair of eCampus Ontario Board of Directors, I'm excited to share this year's journey with you, particularly as we celebrate our 10th anniversary. This year's theme, Transforming Together, will explore the different ways in which digital transformation offers unique opportunities for our sector, and to ensure the best outcomes for learners in a continually evolving future. It reflects our shared commitment to collaboration and is a reminder that no one can navigate this journey alone. We all have collective responsibility as higher education leaders, employers, and partners in meeting the local needs of Ontario's workforce in a rapidly changing global economy. Each of us brings unique perspectives, experiences, and expertise to the table. And it's through our collective efforts that we can transform the future. 
your contributions and expertise are integral to shaping the future of higher education and positioning Ontario as the best place for people to live and work. By working together and creating successful partnerships between industry, community organizations, and post-secondary institutions, we improve learner experiences and we inspire the future workforce to thrive. You all continue to reach new heights as we serve our sector and our learners. Let's continue to support one another and continue to foster a community built on growth and innovation. Together, we all share a common goal to lead into the future as strong, relevant institutions that provide the best possible experience for our students and learners. Together, we have the power to innovate, inspire, and create meaningful change for our communities and beyond. I want to express my sincere gratitude and appreciation for everyone attending today. Your commitment to transforming education is what makes our community so vibrant and impactful. I also want to extend my thanks to everyone on eCampus, all organizers and volunteers, for their hard work in making TESS 2024 a great success. Finally, to Robert Luke, CEO of eCampus, we continue to be inspired by your innovation, foresight, and leadership. To our new vice chair, Rebecca Jameson, a huge welcome to the eCampus Board of Directors. And to Stephen Murphy, our past chair, I continue to be inspired by both of you and the work you do every day. I hope you enjoy the many important discussions taking place over the next few days. And I wish everyone participating an inspiring and productive experience. Thank you. Thank you to Amber Yvonne, President and CEO of Humper Polytechnic and Chair of the eCampus Ontario Board. I am now going to invite uh, Dr. Stephen Murphy, President and Vice Chancellor of Ontario Tech University and past Chair of the eCampus Ontario Board to uh, say a few remarks. Thank you so much, Robert. I'm hoping everyone can hear me. I Firstly, welcome to TESS 2024. I am so proud of this organization. Uh, you can tell by the changes that have been made over the 10 years, many of which that have been relayed to you this morning, um, that this is an organization that stays current, stays true to cultural uh, issues within our country, um, and stays at the forefront of not only technology, but the social fabric, which I have to say is always comes first before technology. As we think about this conference, uh, I, I go back to my first beginnings about six years ago with this organization. Some things it's great that they never change. At the center has always been. Well, have, uh, so then we'll see. Uh, you know, We're having audio trouble or? What is this guy? See, that's. Okay, I'm just going to continue. I'm hearing things in my ear, but assuming that we're good. Um, so, wh where I was uh, before that, I was, uh, I was talking about how far we come as an organization. Uh, yeah. Want to connect the audio here? Can we just stop the background chatter for me? That would be really helpful. Thanks. Sorry, folks in the audience. There's a lot going on behind the scenes here. Um, so uh, very, very proud of where this organization has, uh, has come to. Uh, very proud that the learner is at the center of things. It has always been that way, and it needs to stay that way in the future and certainly learning outcomes. Uh, we can't be complacent. Um, we started with things like OERs and uh, Dr. Jameson, and I know you're gonna hear later on about how we need to think about these things in different ways. 
Um, and we need to continue to innovate because uh, challenges that are faced by, uh, for instance, Indigenous learners can be very different. When we think about access, that word means something very different when we talk about different communities. Yes. And, and in addition to that, we are um, really at the forefront of uh, when we think about our virtual Thanks, learning strategy, we were at the core of how we pivoted to uh, being online. And uh, I'm really, really proud of that. Let's not for a second think that we can go backwards or romanticize the type of one way downloading of information that unfortunately still characterizes much of the learning that goes on at our institutions. We've got a lot of work to do. And I think that uh, understanding the place for online and for how virtual learning strategies can combine with in person is really about our future. And speaking of our future, I would be remiss to not speak about AI and the ethical application of AI. I have no doubt that the work of eCampus Ontario already in AI and will continue in AI to explore ways that we can enhance the learner's journey through learning styles, personalized ways of getting at your learning style and helping you to achieve those outcomes in ways that we just can't do at scale with human beings to help tutor you at every moment of the day where you're willing to get that kind of help. Again, it comes full circle to the learner being at the center of what we do and to improving learning outcomes to tangible things that we can show to employers. I hope that everybody has a great TESS 2024. It's my last one uh, as a board member. I will be back for many more in the future um, outside of the board. So it's, ex it's special to me. I hope you have a great two days and that you richly share your ideas because at the core of eCampus Ontario has always been our members and their innovativeness. And I want to thank you for all of that support and to Robert Luke for everything that he has done as CEO. Um, it has been a wonderful ride. So have a great conference and it's great to be with you here this morning. Thank you. Eldridge to introduce this morning's amazing keynote speaker. I'm so excited. Um, I want to just outline a few important housekeeping items. So in reference to accessibility, eCampus Ontario really goes above and beyond to ensure a safe and inclusive environment for all participants. All of the events in the main hall have reserved seating for individuals with accessibility needs. And we have the amazing Natasha. Natasha, stand up and wave if you can. There she is right at the back corner of the She's the accessibility point person, as are all of the eCampus Ontario team members. Watch if you haven't found them already. Right out of this room and on the left, as you walk straight ahead. Um, we're going to have concurrent sessions throughout the two days. There are going to be main stage sessions here in this room, but also two speaker. breakout sessions. So this that is the out of the room. Do you know what I mean? Is it the first of the summer?
or take the amazing elevator on elevators to so the architects. So this right. I think this person is spotlighting everyone. On your right, and um, so is the photo booth for your close up, right? It, yeah, so if you have, has anyone done a photo booth test? Yeah. Well, it is it's tucked away at the very back of the partner booths. So if you're doing conference buddies, you can get memorating a picture. There's also, of course, the you know, incredible Lee Campus Ontario Partner Showcase. And I have to say, as any conference that has ever existed, the most curated, relevant, interesting, insightful partners. So check out the Partner Showcase. You will be amazed. And in fact, this year, as Robert mentioned, there's a draw for a $100 free to gift card so you have more incentive to get your um, stickers for your name badge. And the name badge bid, when you're finished collecting all your stickers, at the end of day two, you can put it into the bin at the reception desk. Um, and there's a little photo walk place because he comes on to celebrating their 10th anniversary this year, as Robert Moon mentioned. And so photo booth, but also the Stephen McKean, I think it's called in Hollywood and Hollywood North, um, at the back of the room, so we will. So now it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage John Eldridge, Program Manager for Collaborative Sector Engagement, to introduce this morning's keynote speaker. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Don Eldridge, Manager uh, on the Sector Transformation Team here at the campus. It's great to see everyone here. At Checking you up that but it does uh, give me great pleasure to be featured here to discuss 24 uh, first keynote speaker. Uh, so joining us today is uh, Jennifer Wemingwans, uh, Mishinawe from the Big Home, excuse me, Unseated uh, Reserve. She is an assistant professor at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto, where she teaches in the adult education and community graduate program. Uh, Dr. Pendekwan today is pride in working to refer to the convention use media by revealing the potential uh, for Indigenous cultural expression and Indigenous knowledge, new technologies, and education, and arts. Her book, The Digital Bible, Protecting and Promoting Indigenous Knowledge on the Planet, which everyone will be perfect copy today, and you're reading that play home, uh, explores the uh, prospects of education and digital projects that currently prefer to develop new pathways for digital production with a focus on the convergence between indigenous knowledge, and indigenous knowledge the arts, the education. This work supports the articulation of diverse Indigenous knowledge. Prior to joining U of T, Dr. Wemigwans produced numerous resources in deep consultation with Indigenous knowledge keepers and elders from across Canada, the U.S., and Central and South America. She has earned a reputation for ethically translating Indigenous knowledge in ways that are consented and recognized by elders and knowledge keepers, her work in academia and online uh, and, and in online technologies puts her in a unique position to tap the pulse of innovation in Indigenous education, the arts, and media. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jennifer Wemigwans to the stage. This slide. Work back. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, good. Let's see that there. Okay. So, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. And thanks to the eCampus Ontario Conference organizers for their care in bringing us together. Innovation through collaboration has been a key theme in my work since the 1990s. Uh, that's when I was trained by elders and knowledge keepers as an adult uh, literacy instructor for not-for-profit agencies in Toronto. 
So back then it was kind of like working for um, places like the Meeting Place, which still exists at Queen and um, Bathurst, which is a drop-in center. I also worked at Native Women's Resource Center, NAME Res, Council Fire, uh, the Native Canadian Friendship Center, and all of these programs um, really uh, provided um, adult education, community-based programs. And so what happened was we would have a lot of um, Indigenous people from all kinds of walks of life, people who came from all over Canada, people who were housed and people who were not housed. <laughs> And so, you know, the way we we um, were trained was in very particular ways that had to um, address cultural sensitivity as well as address colonial harm and address um, any kind of like maybe uh, addictions or any types of, um, yeah, any types of, I guess, also fears of walking into and thinking about accessing educational programming with very good reason, thinking about intergenerational violence, et cetera. So it was in these communities and, and these types of settings and not-for-profits that I wanted to note that if you can go back to the 90s, that was just the beginning of the internet. And so you have to remember that a lot of these organizations had the first ever computer rooms. Do you remember that? <laughs> Yeah, and the drop-in centers, like these computer rooms, they were like magnets. And I remember seeing the immense gravitational pull they had for all adult learners, right? So Meeting Place was um, a diverse and still is a diverse drop-in center. So it's not only accessed by Indigenous uh, people, but non-Indigenous people as well. And people love to go and use these computers and I could see even then it was, there was novelty, but there was also a cool factor, right? <laughs> to sit in front of a computer and engage. And it was really something to see. And it was then that I had this like spark, this thought about what would it mean to have indigenous knowledge teachings online? What would that look like for our people to walk into a computer room and find their elders, their knowledge keepers online? And what would it mean for our youth to see themselves, their communities reflected back to them? And so it was then that I began to speak with Indigenous educators and elders about the potential for sharing Indigenous teachings, Indigenous knowledge teachings online. These teachings would be seen, and I stress, as an introduction to Indigenous knowledge, right? Because you can't possibly represent a whole teaching by an elder online. It's just not possible, but you can introduce a kind of introduction to it. And so it was a way also for people like myself who were trained in um, adult indigenous literacy instruction to have a way to reference our elders, right? Because we can't always bring elders and knowledge keepers into our classrooms, as you well know, they're very important people, they're doing very important work, and there's not enough elders and Indigenous knowledge keepers to possibly come into each and every one of our classrooms. <laughs> and so it was really important to think about, well, you know, what could having a presence online do? And so that is when um, uh, in talking with the Indigenous educator, educators and elders, we started to talk about FourDirectionsTeachings.com. And that project, FourDirectionsTeachings.com, eventually became a reality after five years of dogged pursuit for production funding. And I want to stress, like, that took five years to find funding. And... Um, once it was launched, it was just incredible because the site was embraced by educators and frontline workers across Canada and culminated in this peer review book that you generously, I'm, I'm just, thank you for, for doing this eCampus Ontario. Wow, like this is amazing that you have the book, but it culminated in this book, a digital bundle protecting and promoting Indigenous knowledge online. And so in this talk, I want to share with you what constitutes a digital bundle and how I work with communities to co-create Indigenous knowledge projects. Okay, let's see if this is going forward. There we go. So 
When we look at the um, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, you can see the quote, I can't read it from this angle, but you can read it for yourselves there. It's really an important uh, statement um, to consider. And I would say that because I'm not sure about eCampus Ontario, but I know Canadian Heritage and other federal funders, like I know eCampus Ontario focuses on the province, but to date there's not a single federal funding body devoted to the production of Indigenous knowledge education online. And I find that really problematic, especially having done this work for since 2006 and knowing the impact it has for communities. So I think that, you know, this is something we need to be talking about because the need for this type of work is tremendous. For most Canadians, uh, digital bundles are often perceived as hiding in plain sight, meaning they are not perceived as teachings because Canadians have no reference for Indigenous knowledge and do not know how to perceive it or read it. So this is due, of course, to colonial epistemic violence, where there's so many misconceptions and stereotypes and even denial of Indigenous knowledge. Right. So to better illustrate what a digital bundle looks like, I'm going to share a short clip with you that will introduce um, some of the ways that um, Four Directions um, brings forward Indigenous teachings. So let's see if this will play. I'm not sure if somebody in tech can help to turn that clip on. It's embedded in the slide. The American continents have been called the new worlds, right. but our histories as the original peoples of these lands tell us. Sorry, I'm just trying to get it back to where it was. This is going, okay, there. Can we start from the beginning? Thank you. Patience with technology, that's our mantra. Do I play it or do I just, yeah, someone's doing it at the back there. Okay, thank you. The American continents have been called the new world, but our histories as the original peoples of these lands tell us we have always been here, that we belong to these places which are sacred to us. Our collective memories go far back beyond what the modern world considers history. We have shared these continents in all the four directions for many thousands of years. To us, this is the old world, and there have been many nations here through the ages. Each of our nations has always had their own ways of life, with distinct beliefs and languages, economic, political and social systems, and medicinal, ecological and other forms of knowledge. Every one of these nations has its own way to recognize its place in the greater hope that we're all part of, and all our diverse forms of knowledge lead back to that common circle. Through our various traditions, we recognize that everything in the universe is connected, that everything has being and deserves respect. We never worship the sun or animals or other forms of nature as gods, but we recognize that these things are symbols of mysteries that cannot be explained in words, and that they all lead back to the greatest mystery of all, the source of all creation. So through our stories and songs, we have always recognized the same ultimate creative force. Some of our elders still remember and maintain the foundations of our original knowledge. We believe that these forms of knowledge can help address urgent matters for the world today. Here we share a few teachings of elders from some of the original nations of North America. The Mi'kmaq of the Atlantic region. The Mohawk or Lodnashoni of Southern Quebec and Ontario and Upper New York State. The Ojibwe or Anishinaabek of the Great Lakes region, the Cree or Nehiwak of the Canadian prairies and woodlands, and the Pecani Blackfoot of Southern Alberta and Northern Montana. Welcome to the Four Directions Interactive Teachings. Okay. So um, this site was launched in 2006 and is still used today. So that says a lot. It is not just a website. It's not just a resource, right? It's not in the cyberspace graveyard at all. 
And in fact, it has outlasted its software uh, production, which was it was built in Flash. And so now it's on hold because Flash went the way of the dodo bird, as we all know. And so we have to rebuild it in HTML5. And we're working on that this year. And I'm also um, very happy to announce that we're adding um, an Indigenous language component. So each of the teachings will now be offered in their original language. So that's really exciting with, you know, corresponding our language resources. So I want to point out that these elders that you see on the screen here represent the vanguard of digital bundles. Um, so we have Stephen Augustine. Um, let me see. I guess that would be in your upper left. He is uh, Mi'kmaq. I'm actually going to visit him next week in Cape Breton to get him to do the Mi'kmaq translation of his teaching. Um, Tom Porter right beside him is Mohawk. And so we're just working with Tom Porter to figure out a time when we can meet. Below, um, again, to your left is uh, Lillian Pitawanaquit Ba. Um, we say Ba because she has passed, she's in spirit world. Um, she's the Anishinaabe um, elder who provided a teaching for the site, Mary Lee. Um, who I will be seeing as well before Christmas is the Cree elder. And in the corner there is Dr. Reg Crochu, who's the Sisica Blackfoot elder. So I want to say that, you know, we have to remember, I said it was very difficult with production funding. And it's not just something that happened outside of Indigenous communities, it actually happened inside Indigenous communities. And I want to kind of explain that to you just to show you how innovative like, and controversial this project was. And so um, it actually, when I was um, applying uh, back before 2006 to Aboriginal Arts Councils for funding to build a pilot, just to like see how this could roll out and what it could look like, um, I applied several times. And every time the commissioning person for the Arts Council would call me and said, you did it again, you split the jury. And I'm like, what? And then they were explaining that, yeah, half the people on that jury said, who does she think she is? This is audacious. You cannot put Indigenous elders teachings online. No way. And the other half were like, wow, this is really interesting. This could be something really important. Let's see what it looks like, right? So eventually I gave up on um, applying to arts councils because I just kept splitting the jury and there was no way to go in and speak to them, right? So it's just a blind process. So I was like, well, I can't keep writing proposals every year after year after year. And then I tried the media organizations like the Ontario Media De Development Corporation. I tried government funders. And what I got from them was they could not comprehend the spiritual element of Indigenous knowledge. And they would reject my proposals based on the fact that they don't fund religious projects. Yeah, it was the spiritual aspect of Indigenous knowledge was conceived as religion. So then I had to turn around, and this is why it took five years, I had to turn around and rewrite my proposals in a way that would educate the non-Indigenous funders to start looking at that component as, let's call it philosophy, <laughs> would that help? So we don't reference spirit as a bad word, and we know that that's a bad word in education, like in general, you're not supposed to bring spirit into the classroom for some reason. Um, so I started saying philosophy. And then slowly that started to, to chip away at, you know, people getting tired of seeing my proposals coming in. Um, so I also realized that after a couple of years, I did reflect on the Indigenous um, arts jurors because they are community people. And I had to think about that, like, okay, what is going on here? And I realized the importance of putting together and working with an Indigenous advisory committee. And so um, I did, I, I went to people in our community across Canada, people who could speak to intellectual property rights, cultural appropriation, and people who were very um, 
activist and, and active about wanting to counter epistemic violence by asserting our rights, as noted by the UN, to revitalize, use, develop, and transmit our knowledge for future generations. And so I'm going to mention who these people are because we did talk about one of the tracks being collaboration. And for Indigenous work, it's all about relationship building and honoring those relations and saying who you are and why you're doing the work and who stands with you. And so this advisory committee was um, for some of you, you may recall Dr. Marie Baptiste. Um, she's currently retired, but she was a of the forefront of Indigenous knowledge education in post-secondary. Um, she has also served as a United Nations expert and co-chair for the UN workshop on Indigenous heritage in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, James Sagage Youngblood Henderson is a noted international human rights lawyer and, an, and also an authority on protecting Indigenous heritage, knowledge, and culture. And also on the advisory committee was Dr. Reg Croshu, a well-known Pakani Blackfoot elder who pioneered and initiated cross-cultural programs for many organizations and institutions across Canada. Diane Hill, who's still active in doing consulting work, and she does this in various Aboriginal education initiatives internationally and working to promote um, culturally based educational strategies. And then of course, Sylvia Miracle. So for people who are involved in Toronto, you would know Sylvia Miracle, um, a very strong Mohawk activist um, who's been involved with the um, Indigenous Friendship Centers for over 30 years, um, serving as the executive director for the Ontario Federation of Indian Friendship Centers. So I note these people because this is what community collaboration looks like, and this is how it works. When I went to see these elders and, um, and um, knowledge keepers, I'm not from their community, right? They're, I'm Anishinaabe. Lillian Penwanaquit is not from my reserve. She was from Whitefish River, and I'm from Wikwamkwang. So you know, you have to be able to use your networks, your indigenous networks to be able to build these community relationships. And so what happened, for example, um, is when I talked to Tom Porter, he said to me, oh, you were referred by Sylvia Miracle. Okay, that's all I need to know. When do you wanna meet? Right? And that's the way that indigenous communities authenticate relationships. Right? They, they look at who are you working with, who is referring you. Um, and at the same time, I got grilled by my advisory committee. Why do you want to do this work? Right, And it really, I had to speak to the UN declaration that this is all about transmitting for the future. This is how we, you know, um, can perhaps combat epistemic violence, but also empower instructors like myself who aren't raised um, as, you know, in traditional values, but were trained that way. But I'm not a knowledge keeper, so I need to reference my elders and knowledge keepers. So I, I want to have something, a resource that I can use, right? That is a, a, an ethical resource. And so, it, it's it, it's all, these relationships were all then based on trust. And this is how the elders then spent time with me and said, yeah, I will share a teaching on this thing called the internet, which I explained to them could be broadcast all over the planet and to Mars. So this was the way to like try to get them to understand what, what, what was happening. And I also, and they also understood that what I was doing was being a helper and that I was working with community and through community by um, creating these relationships and collaborating with them. So their teachings were always brought back to them for their approval, for their direction. It was nothing that I interpreted. I did not take on an artist's role where I would be interpreting their teachings. I merely um, took what they gave me and tried to um, reflect it in ways that would fit into the um, format of the website that we were creating, and then go back, went back to each, to each one of them and asked permission and to see if I got it right and talk to them about the imagery, et cetera. Go to the next one. So elders and knowledge keepers carry knowledge bundles. 
Right. So for I hope people have an understanding of what a knowledge bundle is. It is their sacred um their sacred knowledge or their community bundles. And these um, knowledge bundles signify the teachings that have been entrusted to them through ceremony. So for example, there are pipe bundles that go back to the beginning of a specific revealed ceremony or a tradition that are regarded uh, with care by the community. Chief Avril Looking Horse of the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota Nations is highly regarded when at the age of 12, he received the Sacred White Buffalo Calf Pipe Bundle and its teachings. In this case, the person holding the bundle must undergo a thorough, rigorous process of learning about the meaning of the tradition, the ceremony, and the teachings, and how this knowledge gets transferred to members of the community. Specific cultural definitions of bundles are regarded differently by different indigenous peoples and cultural groups, and therefore will have very particular attributes. But what is important to understand here today is that a knowledge bundle is understood to be sacred and signifies indigenous epistemology. Indigenous knowledge is a complex paradigm. To better articulate it, I have pulled these definitions from my readings of Marlene Brandt, Castanello, Tayaki Alfred, Leanne Simpson, and John Burroughs. For example, I perceive Indigenous knowledge in two distinct forms, sacred teachings and personal knowledge. And this is how um, I would, when I'm talking to my graduate students at OISE and trying to explain why do we call elders elders and indigenous knowledge keepers, indigenous knowledge keepers, it is because they have those sacred teachings. They have teachings that were transferred to them via ceremony or through um, hair or through um, lineage, right? So through uh, the fact like Stephen Augustine is a hereditary chief, for example. Um, I have personal knowledge. I don't have any sacred teachings. No one has passed anything on to me through ceremony. Okay, so that's a huge distinction. So sacred teachings consist of traditional knowledge passed on through ceremonial protocols. Only elders and traditional teachers who have been gifted the indigenous knowledge and teachings in this way can share those teachings publicly and transfer them. This type of indigenous knowledge is often considered as belonging to the community and held in trust by knowledge keepers and elders who are expected to abide by the cultural protocols entrusted to that knowledge, right? And we don't always know what that is, but you know, I'm sure when Chief Avril Looking Horse received that pipe bundle, there were very specific instructions that came along with it. So as a producer of Indigenous knowledge media projects and as an academic, I make it part of my practice to articulate this distinction as to not assume or usurp the role of a knowledge keeper or disrespect Indigenous protocols held by elders who carry the Indigenous knowledge of their communities. This is key because my role is clearly defined as a helper, someone who's going to facilitate and center the elder and their teaching. This is distinct from the role of an artist as someone who interprets indigenous teachings and knowledge, and therefore doesn't necessarily um, center the elder's knowledge or the bundles that they carry. So in clearly articulating my knowledge as acquired knowledge, or as I said earlier, personal knowledge, and in recognizing indigenous knowledge keepers as elders representing the indigenous knowledge protocols of their communities, I'm honoring the diverse cultural copyright. That is the protocols of what John Burroughs refers to as the legal traditions of diverse indigenous nations. And this is part of the thing that I think people who work with intellectual property rights get so frustrated because cultural copyright is always held by the distinct diverse indigenous community. It is not something that can be applied broadly, right? It's not pan-Indian. It's very particular. This is right. So in 2013, I interviewed John Burroughs for my research work, and he told me that he uses fourdirectionsteachings.com, an Indigenous knowledge site that you've been introduced to today, um, in every 
indigenous law course that he teaches. And I was quite surprised to hear this. Um, he explained that indigenous teachings and traditions provide an opportunity to have a conversation and more importantly, to deliberate around what they tell us. Indigenous teachings and traditions then provide the standards for judgment. They are the authorities, they are the guidelines and therefore the precedents. John Burroughs elaborated that they are the criteria that we can access in making decisions and resolving disputes today. For Burroughs, Indigenous teachings can set precedents in the legal sense of the term. Today, Burroughs, along with his colleague Val Napoleon, have created the first program in a Canadian law school to allow an integrated study of the common law and Indigenous legal tradition. And this was launched in 2018 at the University of Victoria, which offers the first ever Indigenous law degree. So that's like 2018, the first ever. And I'm so happy um, to announce that this coming year in May 2025, they will be opening up their um, the first ever Indigenous law building at University of Victoria. So it's really exciting. But I share this because it's a perfect example of the revitalization of Indigenous knowledge systems and practices and how they are key to the movement of Indigenous resurgence and education, right? So... When we think about this, here's an Indigenous law professor using uh, Four Directions teachings in his law courses at the University of Victoria. Meanwhile, as you will read in this book, there's people in Northwest Territories in prison systems who are using it with their inmates. Then you find out that there's people in the children's aids training social workers and referring to it. So it's not something done province by province, but when you put something online like that, it really reaches across the whole country. That is very important to consider when we think about the knowledge gaps and the colonial education system that we're currently still having to deal with and contend with. So for John Burroughs, cultural teachings shared by various elders can be applied to family, relationships, individuals, and personal struggles. For example, he shared and he stated, I could see how this, he's referring to Four Directions teachings, would help me implement our treaty or deal with the storage of nuclear waste, which we are confronting in our territory now. Having access means we could say, here is a teaching that can give us some guidance on how to deal with ecological problems that are happening on the Saugeen Peninsula. Or here is a teaching, uh, for example, that could be applied to personal injuries and property um, issues, or even to the way um, we or even to the way people do business with one another. It's pretty impressive what this kind of um, access to indigenous knowledge could do for us. And he says, I think it could change the world. And I agree with him wholeheartedly. Um, and I think that there's probably a reason why we don't see a single funding body yet devoted <laughs> to indigenous knowledge education online, because it is that powerful. It is that transformational. Um, when we think about this, it's. It, I want to point to, um, I believe this was Linda Tawai Smith's work that sharing is a political strategy um, for resistance, right? It's also a political strategy for resurgence because through sharing across our networks of indigenous people, we fortify our knowledge, our principles, and our collective abilities. And that also, I've seen that happen, not just across Canada, but people picking up the site and looking at it in the US. And I've also had people from South America asking for it to be translated in Spanish, because as we know, um, if you are, well, some people in the room might be familiar with the prophecy of the eagle and the condor. And that is the idea that indigenous nations um, would come together again to fortify their knowledge through their networks. And we're seeing that happen. I'm actually involved in a project that does that work called Indigenous Timekeepers. So it's really, um, this is really integral, right? To have these kinds of um, 
projects available. But what I do want to note for this audience today is there's a really interesting tension to consider here, and that is around open educational resources. So Four Directions Teachings is out there, but in some ways, even up until now, it's still hiding in plain sight. And why? Because most Canadians do not know how to read the site. I had one prominent Canadian artist say, I went to the site and I didn't get it. I thought it was just like really, you know, folklore. And I was like, no, it's not folklore. It's not, you know, it's not stories or folklore or nursery rhymes. It's they are teachings. And when you go to each teaching, you see who the elder is. So it's not pan Indian either. Right. So the Mohawk teaching, then you click and you see the bio, you understand why Tom Porter is who he is and why he's able to share this this teaching with you. So these are things that are really important, but non-Indigenous people don't know how to read it. Indigenous people come to it and they're like, oh, I wish I could put down tobacco for these elders. I wish I could give them tobacco. I wish I could put down tobacco for you, for being a helper. They get it. They see the protocol. They feel it through the way the site is delivered, through the, through the way it's designed as a circle, right? Even that they understand, the, um, the literacy of it, the visual imagery. So there's so much I could go on just to talk even around that, around instructional design. But this is... Um, this is the way it's doing two things. It's hiding in plain sight for most Canadians, but it's also combating epistemic violence for many Indigenous people who visit the site. I guess one thing I can share for you that was kind of, um, it was really a powerful story, but it was also very sad, was um, a friend of mine who does hospice work in Ottawa said that um, when this was in the early days of the site being out for the first year, um, he had a um, he had um, an Indigenous man who was dying, dying of AIDS. And he said that this Indigenous man would just go to the Four Directions website and play the teaching over and over again for his nation and he and it was like it was just giving him something it's some solace or something but he said whenever he saw him he would just play that teaching and did that over and over again and it was just really something to hear because i i i kept getting reports from different people just how so many um people who maybe aren't connected to their community or can't be at home right? That this was a profound spiritual connection for him. Um, I remember a curator at um, a Toronto art site saying she saw um, some young Blackfoot people walk in and kind of look at all this new media work. And when they saw the Four Directions um, site, they immediately went to the um, Dr. Reg Crowshoe's teaching. And she said, you know, she didn't ask them, but she said it was like they sat there and they went through it all. And then when they got off it, they were kind of walking with their heads held a little higher. <laughs> and I just thought that was so amazing. You know, people walking into a, a space like an art gallery and not really feeling like, oh, am I, is this safe? Am I okay here? But then being able to feel uplifted and connected and respected and have dignity, right? So I think that more than education, this is the way that, such work can combat epistemic violence on so many levels. Okay, so having um, in digital bundles online provides new possibilities for Indigenous communities and for people who are searching and wanting to learn more about Indigenous knowledges. And as we know, a great majority of our communities, um, we just have to look at our children in children's aid systems, right? aren't growing up in community. So how are they going to find it? We need these resources because they're online with all your children too, right? We know that, that they're there. So a digital bundle then is not only a form of resistance and co-optation to the state, but a new infrastructure for creating community solidarity across Indigenous nations using our own practices and protocols. A digital bundle is significant, Indigenous designation for Indigenous knowledge online because it elevates the cultural protocol and cultural responsibilities of that content. 
and I have to stress that because Indigenous people know what how important and sacred an Indigenous knowledge bundle is. When they hear the term digital bundle, they understand that that is a knowledge bundle presented through technology, right? It is sacred and it is important. It's not something that can just be discarded. So working with Indigenous values and processes are very different, especially if you position yourself as a helper. It is understood that in the role of a helper, you accept that your role is not interpretation or transmission, but facilitator. You're facilitating this knowledge that is coming from a very specific knowledge keeper or elder. This model and practice are very different from the Western roles of producer, director, or even artist, right? So when I have to apply for something, yeah, I'll say producer, but that's not how I see myself. It's, I'm beyond a producer. Producer's too controlling, too AAA, right? And I can't afford to be like that. I have to be collaborative. I have to be humble and I have to follow direction. So working as a helper reinvigorates Indigenous collaborative models of community creation. For example, um, in the research I'm undertaking now for Indigenous timekeepers, the elders and knowledge keepers I'm working with understand that we are creating knowledge bundles and that these bundles will be created through utilizing new technologies. We are all open to the process and have acknowledged that we will, that it, we will have to take great care and time to work with these technologies to ensure that they are respectful and appropriate to the task at hand. So these digital bundles, are, are not just online, they can be augmented reality. I've actually created one with uh, Dr. Jacques gokamis Lavalle that you can see um, using your phone, right? So that's an augmented reality digital bundle. But we're also looking at interactive documentary and even virtual reality. For Indigenous communities, the idea of a bundle speaks to knowledge that is grounded within Indigenous philosophical paradigms and knowledge. And as I said, yeah, there are funding issues. So I think that, um, you know, we have to start thinking seriously and we have to start really um, maybe um, thinking about what Canadian federal funding could look like for such work. Um, we need to um, acknowledge that, yeah, the arts councils currently have changed their focus. They don't just fund artists anymore. They also fund um, what they call um, cultural custodians. But a helper is not a cultural custodian. Like they're calling something that hasn't happened yet. And the reason I say that is that I haven't yet done the work to find out from Indigenous elders, how do we transfer digital bundles? Right. When I'm no longer here, how are we, how am I going to transfer, as I understand knowledge bundles are transferred through ceremony, how will I transfer the care of these digital bundles to the next generation? We haven't had those conversations yet. To me, that signifies a cultural custodian, right? But I can't apply to Aboriginal Arts Councils as a cultural custodian because I'm not a cultural custodian. I'm just a helper right now. So there's just, you know, how do we have these conversations that are really community-based, right? And that actually um, come from the elders and people working in the field instead of just, you know, kind of terminologies being decided upon in offices behind closed doors. So these are the things that I'm, you know, doing this work, you have to be very methodical, right? You have to think about all the processes and steps that need to be taken. So these funding barriers, of course, um, impact the work and dissemination of Indigenous knowledge keepers, elders, and helpers to create accessible content for the broader public and Indigenous communities. And I just want to say that, you know, even um, when we look at the various ministries of education, we understand that, you know, when they develop their curriculum with their teachers, they do it locally, province by province. And I looked at this because I thought, oh, could I go to the Ministry of Education and apply for funding to do this work? And it was problematic because then they wanted to abide by only Ontario curriculum, which then kinds of... It, what it does is it locks the project down. It doesn't make it as widely accessible as something like Four Directions, which can reach across, right? And not only benefit um, Ontario, but benefit everyone and all kinds of fields and disciplines, not just, say, 
elementary or post-secondary. So these are things we need to think about. Um, and that we also need to recall that um, the problem with kind of creating curriculum provincially, like province by province, uh, I think it's kind of problematic because Indigenous knowledge keepers don't work in the education system, right? Elders aren't employed by the education system. So they can't really, um, you know, create and, and follow the requirements for educational curriculum development. So you kind of start to need to think differently. You have to think, where are the helpers and how can they work and understand that when elders and knowledge keepers gift their teaching, they don't do it province by province. They do it for everyone, right? And it's kind of like going back to those old ways of thinking. We never really acknowledge the borders, right? We have kin in the US, we have kin in South America, we have kin up North. And so when we're creating work, we're doing that as a gift for everyone. So we need to kind of like break out of these kinds of restrictions, these funding regulations, these curriculum regulations. What we did with Four Directions Teachings is because we recognized that we couldn't create curriculum specifically for Ontario, we put suggested curriculum for teachers. So if you go on the site, you'll see there's suggested curriculum for each of the teachings from JK up to grade 12. Okay, so... Um, I just want to um, end by saying, you know, I know I've kind of thrown a lot of different things at you today, um, thinking through this, but I want to note that, you know, our protocols and how we work with this kind of knowledge tells us what can go into the commons and what doesn't. And that is done community by community, elder by elder. They define and state what they want public and what's to be held back right? That's, that's how that is done. Our knowledge is recognized by those who know how to read differently and those who take time to understand. And that's the big thing at the push now, I think, with education. We don't have enough people who know how to read differently and who know how to um, see what's in front of them, right? It's hidden in plain sight. And I would say that, you know, this hiding in plain sight is, of course, enabled by a system that has erased and disparaged our knowledge system since the time of contact. So having digital bundles online helps us push back and center Indigenous knowledge for our communities, for our children, for our youth. And we are present. And I think that for me, it's more important to be present for our communities, whether we're seen or not seen by non-Indigenous people, right? Whether we're seen or not seen is, is not really um, wasn't really my goal from the beginning, but yeah, I'm open to discussion on that. And how can we start to maybe combat some uh, colonial education by thinking about doing work differently? Okay, naha, miigwech. Right on the dot. You are right on the dot, people. <laughs> Thank That's you. amazing. Thank you so much. Okay. Wow. Wow. This, okay. This room was spellbound. That was an incredible opening keynote. Thank you so much, Dr. Wen Wigwans. That was beyond and a lot to think about heading into our break this morning. Do you agree? Are you so glad that you checked out of work for two days? You made the right decision. You made the right decision. And I know the emails are piling up, but let's not worry about that now. As my daughter, when she was young, would say, never mind about that. Don't talk about that. It was when she did something wrong. She'd say, never mind about that. <laughs> anyway, okay, so we're heading into our break right outside this room, washroom, straight ahead to your left. We have two concurrent sessions. I mean, two sessions of concurrent sessions. There will be three coming right up at 1040. And then there will be two. So the one session in Beaton Hall, the one at 11.30, had to be canceled. Unfortunately, something came up last minute. Life happens. Um, that was the one into a glimpse into the future of assessments. So we'll redistribute to two. Okay, so three concurrent sessions coming up, two at 11.40, and then we're off for lunch. Okay, so everyone go enjoy the break. Enjoy your concurrent sessions. Thank you. <laughs>